Um, I am on the land of the Narragansett and Wampanoag people. Karen is in Palo Alto on the land of the Ohlone, uh, Muwekma, um, Rumayish, and Tem Temayan um, nations. And then Ray is in D.C. on the land of the Piscataue and Nakachtank people. Um, and it's important for us to acknowledge the native owners of the lands we occupy as we work to be equitable and move beyond a white colonial and ableist approach to science communication. So today, as we talk about our work um, on documenting, documenting these landscapes of science communication, addressing land relations is one step towards being anti-colonial in our scholarship and in identifying truly decolonial approaches to this work. Um, so from there, um, I'm gonna share my screen and go through my presentation first. Um, so I am here to talk to you actually about a landscape of inclusive science communication, um, which I conducted in um, alongside Sunshine Menezes, who you've all probably seen throughout the conference um, this weekend. Um, and this was conducted from 2018 through 2019. And then we published our report at the end of last year, 2020. Um, and it, was an it was an, a process of interviewing 30 leaders in the field or in the movement of inclusive science communication um, across all kinds of sectors and um, disciplines and different stages in their careers. And we identified these um, leaders through partnerships with, um, through our advisory board who were helping to guide the research. Um, and along with those 30 interviews that were um, a qualitative semi-structured approach, um, we also held focus groups with early career leaders in this movement um, at SACNES in 2019 um, and uh, at the ARIS Symposium in 2020. Um, and the motivation for this study, well, let me advance, um, right, or rather situating what inclusive science communication is, which I know we've been talking about all weekend, but just so you know how we were looking at it in this project, um, we were defining inclusive science communication as any effort to engage people in science, technology, engineering, math, um, and medicine that is grounded in inclusion, equity, and intersectionality. Um, and so this is a very broad tent that we tried to um, use for defining science communication in this project because as we were branding this term, we knew that this work was going on um, among a lot of communities that may not have seen themselves as science communicators. And so um, we thought that this broad definition of the term would help ensure we were reaching all of those different experts in all of their different approaches. Um, and the motivation for this project was what you're at today. Um, the original, or the inaugural rather, um, Inclusive SciComm symposium, symposium in 2018 um, really revealed to us just how much was already going on in this movement and how we were all having very similar conversations um, in somewhat disjointed ways. And so we thought it was a great opportunity to um, investigate how we might uh, avoid replication, um, being repetitive and bring all of those conversations together so we could learn from each other. Um, and so uh, the, the research started um, after that first initial symposium and continued through 2020. Um, and it is all founded on this approach to science communication that inclusive SciComm tries to advocate for, which is a transition from this top-down hierarchical approach to science communication where you have um, scientist experts or um, people who are experts in the field in some elite defined way and transitioning to a more democratic mode of communication where we recognize the expertise of all people involved in a communication effort or engagement effort um, and recognize that there is ex expertise that comes from our daily lives, from um, inheriting stories, um, from living our lives and not just from um, the degrees or the letters that come after our names. Um, and so in investigating that, um, our participants were largely female. We ended up with 24 female participants and six male participants. And we did our best to try to balance these things out to have um, 
balance representation across all identities. Um, but that proved to be somewhat difficult, which is another finding I'll mention later on. Um, so we ended up with uh, most of our participants were people with PhDs, um, but then we did manage to have a relatively balanced um, across the various sectors and modes of um, science communication, um, the definitions of which kind of evolved over time to, to align with um, where these different people were based. Um, but it, we, we were based in the US with this study. So most of the participants were US based with some based in um, Canada and Western Europe. Uh, but based on this uh, landscape study, uh, the three the three key findings, which I these <laughs> this is kind of where I'm going first because these are probably things you've been hearing a lot about this weekend. But the three key things that came out of the interviews when I did the analysis was um, intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity as the key traits to making a, an approach truly an inclusive approach to science communication, but always grounded in equity because you can do these things without thinking about equity, and then you're not actually achieving that inclusive result. So. Every interviewee explicitly made clear how intentional their approach to science communication was um, and their awareness of who their audience is and how they're defining science in their work. Um, and that was a, a characteristic specific to an inclusive approach rather than just the way they would define science communication more generally. Um, something that came across um, explicitly and um, somewhat more implicitly was this idea of reciprocity. So how is there a give and take between the person organizing an engagement effort and the people that are in their audience? Um, and how can those efforts uh, address past and continued inequities through ensuring that our partners, partnerships are equitable and equal um, in, who, in power relations? And then finally, um, what came across very importantly and more subtly was reflexivity. So a continuous reflection on who the researchers or practitioners are in their work and how that informs what they should or shouldn't be speaking about and, and how they can continually evolve their practices. So this came across through a lot of, of humility in um, how they viewed themselves in these spaces. Uh, there are a number of challenges for this field um, or movement um, in adva advancing it as we go forward. So some of the areas for future work are in um, finding the figuring out how we can tackle the way that, that all of these different fields um, and methods and sectors are asking similar questions, um, but using different terms to do so. And so that creates some isolated silos um, and working to figure out how we can bring those together. Also, further on this language part, um, there's the challenge of a lot of this conversation happening in English. Um, and so that is very exclusionary as well of all of the science communicators who um, don't do their science communication in English. Also just with identifying with the movement, a lot of the participants even, particularly in the museum and in formal spaces, didn't see themselves as a part of the science communication movement. Um, another challenge, as was indicated by our participants, um, was a limited diversity among early leaders which could potentially have a uh, impact on how, how powerful the movement is in the long run. So as you saw, we, we made a significant effort to have um, participants who identified not as female uh, along with our female participants. Um, and unfortunately, despite our best efforts, it still ended up very imbalanced. Um, so that's something that we're aware of um, as something for future future research. Um, and then something that the, these symposia have helped to start tackling is that there was also a finding of a lack of formal curricula and training for how to do inclusive science communication. So it makes it hard to advance the movement when we don't have resources to help people find their way into it. Um, and then of course, that's not just with the curricula, but also with support from institutions, be that academia, or government agencies or nonprofits. Um, so making sure it's not just the one person who is the equity or diversity person, but that it's foundational to the institution as a whole. Um, but along with these challenges, there also are of course, lots of opportunities for how we can tackle them that we identified um, from both our participants and from analysis. 
So framing our movement as something that is united and that big tent rather than specific to um, a discipline or specific to academia or practice and finding those the intersections so that we can see this as um, in a transdisciplinary movement. Um, and further going to events like this um, and in-person events when that's appropriate, um, building resource sharing networks and um, human networks to help us, again, foster our sense of collaboration and connection to each other's work. Um, part of why I organized this panel um, with myself, Karen and Ray, is one of our other key findings was the importance of supporting uh, early career folks who are doing this work because in our research we found early career science communicators really are grounded in a sense of equity from the baseline. Um, and so there's a lot that we can all learn um, from them and especially for folks who are higher up um, or farther along rather in their careers. Um, holding the door open for others to walk through is really important so we can create in, uh, inclusive science communication as the default. Um, and then of course, in a tackling those institutional barriers, funding is a major um, opportunity to be aware of so that we can um, make sure that there are opportunities for this labor to be compensated um, and to make sure that we can keep this movement growing. Um, I don't have time to go through all of these um, one by one, but in our full report, there, there are 10 um, recommendations that we give um, as, as the major steps to, as they're all opportunities to advance um, inclusive science communication. And so um, depending on where you're situated in this movement, um, some may be more or less relevant to you. Um, and so, of course, the first is the starting point is that to ground all of our, our practice in inclusive science communication and those three key traits of intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity. Um, and really, that's all about that an iterative approach of, of being very aware of who we're working with and how that's changing and how we as practitioners and researchers are changing over time. Um, and building on that through through the rest of these 10, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to read through them all. I'll post a link to the report where you can read um, some descriptions of how we can do this in practice. And I'd love your input as well during our discussion. Um, I lost power over my slides. Um, yeah, and so then another, another big uh, important one that I just wanted to emphasize is the importance of breaking down our disciplinary boundaries and looking across disciplines, across sectors and modes to recognize other ways of knowing besides um, our uh, Western ways of knowing and defining science um, to help really build collaborations that work across the spectrum of research to practice um, so that we can really engage in um, solutions-driven thinking um, and collaborative thinking. Um, I'm gonna skip driving into these other ones. Oh, well, actually I will say this. So these are two of the things on here are important resources that help our steps towards developing some of this curricula. So in the middle is the ye-stem.org um, equity compass, um, which is a great tool um, for evaluating your own work to see how equitable it is and give you some um, steps towards uh, accomplishing your goals and then on so the do no harm guide is a great guide in uh, um, making sure that your data visualizations are equitable. So um, some, some early examples of how we can try to tackle this challenge of access to curriculum and training um, and keep supporting early leaders. Um, that'll be my final little recommendation as I wrap up. Um, and, but I wanna emphasize that when we did this landscape report, we were trying to document what was already out there um, and create branding this movement as inclusive science communication was a way to integrate existing efforts um, and find a way to bring them all together, not think, not claiming um, or trying to first be doing any kind of firsting as um, Dr. Liberon said on Thursday. Um, so rather just to improve our collaboration across uh, approaches. Um, that's it for me for now. Um, thank you for listening. Um, all right, and now 
I am going to pass it to Ray, who will give us her presentation. Thank you, Katie. Um, okay, let's see. Do, 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 do. Share and present. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rayhane Maktoufi. I go by Ray. Um, I'm a misinformation fellow, a Rita Allen Foundation Civic Science Fellow, lots of different things in it. Um, and I'm housed at GBH Nova. I produce content on the science of science communication and I do research about the science of science communication, especially in media. And we wanted to do this um, landscape analysis because um, I come from an academic background. So I see all these different researchers that do, uh, I was one of them that do work on, here are all the best kind of like messages that we have, here are who our audience is, here are how we should talk about different things. So we study the science of science communication and then there are media producers who actually do the work of science communication. And I think there's always a little bit of gap between the communication between people that are doing this research and people that are using actually the practical things that um, the research could help them with. So we wanted to do this landscape analysis to basically figure out, okay, what is the demographic of this filmmaking community? And when I say science filmmaking, I mean YouTubers, broadcasters, people that make content like video media on social media. We I also wanted to see what is this whole um, situation with research practice collaboration. What are the attitudes about it? What are some of the barriers that is causing them not to interact with one another? And what are some of the opportunities? We also wanted to see what the um, what are these um, producers using to impact their measures, what they know about their audience, and we also wanted to see okay as as a status quo of communication, thinking about a strategic communication, what are their goals, what are the objectives that they have these producers, what are the tactics they use. But today, because there's a lot of content and not that much uh, time, I'm just doing a, a very high level, more important content. And because this is also about not only pre presenting a landscape but also identifying find gaps and opportunities. For the opportunities, I will be talking about examples of uh, a show we did at PBS Nova to, to actually, in a way, address some of those gaps. Okay, so who is our community, this community of filmmakers? Some of the very interesting um, highlights was that um, generally when we look at the education, it's fairly high in the, we, we, they have bachelor's, they have master's degrees, they have doctor's degrees. Um, the community is very uh, highly uh, a white community, around 70%, more than 70%. And then you see those little bits of um, the Asian communities, Hispanic. Um, so in the data, we didn't have any uh, the Native Americans, American Indians, or Alaskan Indian um, filmmakers, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they didn't fill the survey. Um, and I, I just have to say this landscape is a mix of survey data and also interview content, but the methodology, if later in the q and I'll be happy to talk about it. This is all the survey data. Uh, the community, however, has a higher number of um, female producers. That might also be a bias because the person who sent out the survey, me, was female. So that might be uh, one of the reasons. Uh, so other than that, some of the highlights of the demographics, we also want to see, OK, what's the deal with this research practice connections? Let's look at the attitude um, and the behavior that they had. We asked them in the past year, how often did they interact with science communication research or researchers that meant maybe like reading a paper, going to a conference. Um, uh, and the result was mostly once a year or never. Then we asked them, okay, how much do you want to get those science communication research, interact with science communication researchers? And it was mostly they wanted to have these interactions about once a month or multiple times a month. And the other questions that we had, we know that they think the science of science communication is actually effective, is helpful, and they are interested to learn more about it. Now, what's the deal? What are the barriers that are not letting this connection happen that causes that only once a month to happen? Um, the highest barrier that we're getting is actually lacks, lack of access to scientists and science communication research. In the interviews, when we ask for the details, a lot of it's because science communication research, there's a paywall, there's no access to it. We don't know where these research is. It's filled with jargon. Uh, the producers don't have time and they don't even know a lot of them that the field of science communication as a research field even exists. Um, Okay, so we asked, so what are the opportunities? What are the ways 
you do want to receive that information so that it's more helpful. Where should we find you? How do you want to receive that information? And um, this is a little more complicated um, uh, graph, but basically some of the ways they wanted to, um, they were more interested in receiving that science communication information was just having a conversation with a social scientist, right? Having a casual chat, having brown bag sessions. And after that was videos, just watching videos about the science of science communication. So then we asked them, how do you measure your impact? What do you know about your audience? Um, and I skipped some of that, but generally they measure the impact through um, social media data. So comments, YouTube analytics. Um, and when it gets to their audience, the audience moves between like 21 to 69 year old. Um, that's more YouTube though, like broadcast, it goes towards like definitely uh, above 50 years old. They want younger audiences, but when you ask in interviews, there are not specific strategies they know to use to get that younger audience. Their audience is mostly male, but they want to get more diverse audience and female audience. We ask them what the ethnicity of their audience is. They think it's probably white, um, but mostly they don't know because again, with social media data, they don't really know much about the ethnicity race of their audiences. Okay, so just to address why these matter um, and how, what are some opportunities when you bring in more uh, diverse producers um, uh, in the game. Um, we, we were at PBS Nova, uh, a show that we worked on was called Sciencing Out. Uh, and to address one of those uh, barriers that people don't know the science of science communication exists and how does it look like, we made a three-part episode um, on women in history who have used science communication strategies to communicate science. We brought in uh, the stories of a lot of women of color and we behind the camera were also diverse. So uh, our team was Arlo Perez, who is a Mexican digital producer, Ana Aceves, who was my co-producer in this uh, process. She's a Mexican American digital producer, and I am an Iranian producer and science communication researcher. So that kind of, I think, did help us think about um, science communicators that are also more diverse. We thought of Mona Chalabi, who talked about data visualization, Paula Kahumbo, who talked about trust building, Nalini Nadkarni, who talked about public engagement. And even you can go back in time and have Hypatia of Alexandria and see how she built mutual grounds between herself and her audience and did public engagement. Even the stories that we had, like the story of Lady Mary Wardy Montague, who brought back vaccination inoculation from Turkey. And most of the stories, we don't hear about that Turkey side of it. And we wanted to see, okay, like let's include them in the stories. There were just like wise women that were teaching her how this whole inoculation thing works, how they're doing this. And later she also used that in her own um, that advocacy when she went back to England to say, hey people, this is how we do inoculation. So, so it, it, this all to say, when you're bringing more diverse people behind the camera, we can tell more diverse stories. Um, but another part of our landscape was about figuring out what are people's goals, objectives, and tactics. And by goal, I mean really long-term final effects that producers want to see in their audience. Um, it's not very immediate. Um, just a very general overview of, of what we got. Obviously, producers, a lot of them want to see behavior change in their audience. Um, like, I want them to vote differently. I want them to plan trees. A lot of them were hesitant. They were like, oh, I do not want to have change in my audience. That's like either goes in realms that I don't want to touch it, so, which we thought was an interesting finding. Uh, a lot of them think about changing attitudes. We want people to feel excited about science, appreciate science. Um, and one of the interesting ones was also personal satisfaction, especially for YouTube producers who had more autonomy. For us, the way this um, worked out was that we wanted to produce these shows so that people can use uh, and do use strategies of science communication that are evidence-based in their work. We wanted to change the attitude so that they feel this positive uh, feelings about using science communication research and evidence, uh, but also feel positive about people that do such things. And also we, we wanted to have that personal satisfaction, which came out of having executive producers that gave us autonomy and let us do the things we wanted to do. So if you look at these three episodes in episode one, I think we were a little more conservative. We didn't know how much we can bring ourselves in the story. So you can see me just wearing my jeans, not a lot of makeup, just like wearing these 
um, fairly simple clothing. On episode two, we felt a little more empowered to bring in more of ourselves. I'm wearing my traditional Persian dress with my um, mangule earrings because Anna is also a huge fan of big earrings. Um, and in episode three, I wore my um, mirror work earrings with just like a lot of dresses with pizzazz and my blue eyeliner. And we felt that, okay, we can have fun. We can be silly and goofy and bring all of ourselves in the story and really felt that personal satisfaction. When it gets to objectives, that means things that you want people to feel when they watch the show, like right away, right? All the changes um, that are produced, like I watch it now, these are the kind of changes that might happen in me. And some of the top things we saw was um, uh, producers wanted people to feel that um, someone is empathizing with them and is caring for them, that the information is relevant to them and it's important, and they feel different emotions that might be hope, that might be concern, that might be um, a feeling of um, awe or curiosity, and they wanted people to trust them. Um, and this is one, the first set of ob objectives. For us, we wanted to produce all of these as well, but we also wanted to have a more diverse audience. That means when we talk about empathy and care, we wanna build trust, we have to be transparent. We have to address emotions like pain that people might have experienced during interaction with science. And that importance and relevance must be a historic importance and relevance too. So for example, in an episode where we had, uh, we were talking about the story of Florence Nightingale and how she used data visualization to have a health revolution in Britain, we also wanted to bring in this idea that like Florence Nightingale with all the great things that she had, let's remember she was a colonialist. She was, she was someone that believed in colonizing. Uh, she believed that it's important for England to, um, you know, impose their culture and any alternative would be simply preserving their barbarism, their meaning the other countries that were colonized for the sake of preserving their humanity, their lives. Um, and, and we thought to build that trust and that connection, it's important to talk about that. We also wanted to talk about objectives that are about, uh, and, and the producer wanted to, uh, talk about objectives that are about norms. Hey, listen, everyone else is doing this good thing that we say you should be doing. This is the scientific process. Let us educate you about these different topics and give you this feeling of self-efficacy, meaning I have the ability to make these changes. So to do that, we had the story of Paula Kahumba, who is a wildlife filmmaker, and we wanted to talk about the research um, it, in a way, educating the audience about trust building based on the evidence and based on the work of Dr. John Besley, who was also um, an advisor on this um, project. I'm gonna show this, it's very short, and then that will be it. In the, in the next period. It never occurred to me how important it was that people really felt my intentions. I always thought, you know, you know, it's on my CV, <laughs> you know, here are my credentials. So when I went to see them, I was trying to explain to them, you know, I've come to make this film. And they just looked at me and they said, we know, we've already accepted you. We already know that you've come here with good intentions. They could see it in my eyes, in my body language. They could hear it in my voice. And they could see it in the way I interact with other people. It was very important. Trust is really important that it's backed up by integrity and that what we say is what we're thinking, what we're doing, we're all aligned. Um, and yeah, so things like that, we try to uh, bring in the stories of people like Paula so that when people see these examples of uh, how to build trust based on the evidence base, it's also a story that might be uh, someone that looks like me. It's a it's a more diverse story. It's um, uh, one that is telling me step by step how to build that trust. Um, I skipped a lot of things. So I'd be happy to talk about like some of the details in the Q&A, but I don't want to go over time. Thank you. And... I'm gonna move to Karen's presentation. Hello everyone. So happy to be here. And I will say that I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit new to this community. Um, I, I am a, I guess you would call a biophysical scientist. I'm a microbiologist by training and um, but who's also always been really, really 
passionate and interested in it's my career my goal of my career is to move um, to think very broadly about science and society oh whoops sorry about that um, and um, so I just finished my term as a civic science fellow um, at a, an organization called the Science Philanthropy Alliance and um, as I am this was the work work I did as a civic science fellow and so to get you situated, um, this work is work that I was requested by, um, so by the Kavli Foundation, and they are in a partnership with um, the Department of Energy Office of Science, um, and their collaboration, this partnership, um, they, they've named CIPEP, which is the Science Public Engagement Partnership. So they um, reached out to me and the, my, the Science Philanthropy Alliance. And they, they, the, the goal of this partnership is um, to support in particular, a particular section of science. They are really interested in basic science. So they define basic science as curiosity driven or fundamental research. So we're gonna, this is narrowing down to just a particular section of the scientific world, which is the really knowledge for knowledge sake is what you can think of. So then um, th this, this partnership, they really are, not, it's not only just, it, it has just started, they're starting to, they're getting together and their goal is to really make sure that this engagement and with basic science itself is supported, sustainable and effective. So in order to understand the landscape of, of communication and engagement, so in CIPIP, um, I will send the link in a second. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not just, it was a particular conference, but this is a long-term endeavor. And what, what they first did, one of the first things when this partnership was established was to commission a literature review by perhaps some of these are household names in the science communication community, but or maybe not. I just met them not that long ago and I was so happy to meet them. Uh, they commissioned the literature review from Professor John Besley of Michigan State and Professor Todd Newman of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And the goal of this literature review, they wanted to say, okay, in, this, in, the, in the academic literature, uh, to what extent do we see um, scholarship on communication and engagement, particularly with basic science. So they wanted to ask Todd and John to see if this actually was, it was anything written about if communicating and engagement basic science was distinct from anything else, from all the other types of, of communication and engagement. And so the result was that not much. And so there's a wonderful webinar that I will send the link to as well. Um, I don't want to mess right now with, with the chat, but um, it's excellent work that they did, but they figured out that actually, no, there is not much that is specifically written about basic science and what is unique about communicating basic science um, and, commun and engaging with basic science. Yet we know that engaging and communicating with basic science is happening all the time. So what they came to me to do is they said, okay, um, we want you to go out and interview a diverse set of practitioners that identify themselves as being in the engaging and communicating space with basic science. And so that I could capture these projects, which are often not in the literature, right? They're not, as, we, as, we, as they saw in their landscape, they don't end up being uh, written up. So then we wanted to start collecting um, and, and knowing who does this kind of work, not only the people, but also what kind of projects, but also the barriers and strategies that they, they have to overcome. And if there's anything unique, like as Katie mentioned, there's a lot of barriers and a lot of unique um, to science communication itself. But the question was, is there is something specific to basic science? And there was this big conference in July and so I had to do this as a context right before just all this to happen, collect this data before the conference itself so that they could help use this and inform, um, inform the conference content itself. So what I did is that I did 21 interviews. Um, I reached out to a bunch of people, but it was in the short period of time, 21 interviews. They were 30 minutes semi-structured. 
And in order to help me make sense of the data, I interviewed 15 people, those 21, 15 that were um, what I would call practitioners, that they would self-identified as like, I do science communication engagement as, they, as part of what I do every day. There was two of them that were researchers who basically were doing research on science communication and engagement with basic research. And then there were four managers of programs that um, were usually training science scientists to become to do engagement and communication so that's those were the 21 people that i interviewed and then of those 15 um the practitioners that i'm calling this and i'm using the word practitioner very broadly um for uh four were people that were basically when i say engaged that they were actually going out to communities they were actually part of a big part of their work was going into and talking to people face to face surrounding themselves organizing to that kind of work two of them were uniquely uh, animators they were illustrators they were people that were working much more concretely in the creative space but they were still of course putting their their work out there and they're creating for example um animations of cells, animations of, of and visualizations of basic research work and putting it out there. And then for nine people that were really the, the bulk of what they were doing was communication. Um, so then I did a big thematic analysis. There's no, this is all the categories that I, I looked into for and, and broke down into this um, for these 21 interviews. I consulted with these wonderful professors, Sarah Yeo at the University of Utah, and also with Professor John Beasley and Todd Newman themselves. And what I was, and, and I want to share with you some of the interesting results that I um, collected. First of all, this was. Um, I, I, I took a little bit of, a, of an interest in figuring out, of course, this is in no way comprehensive. This was more of a snapshot, but all the training programs of the, of the people that I spoke that were managers, so these were people that were training scientists, this particular basic scientists, people that were doing you know, astrophysics in the lab, um, and then they were training them to go out and become communicators or to engage with communities. I thought it was really interesting. I spent some time thinking about what were the characteristics of those programs. And it was fascinating to me um, that a, th a theme was that most of these programs were building on the scientists' interests. So they were using, um, they, they were centering the scientists and saying, asking them, what, what interests you? Let's build on those interests. And I thought it was interesting because oftentimes those interests in that connection would take them away from the context of their research themselves so you know they would they, they, they i was hearing uh, stories like oh we we trained this um microbiologist she's a microbiologist and her work is in you know understanding you know i don't know the the cell membranes but she her interest is in um she has a, a hobby of doing you know kombucha and sauerkraut so they were building on the on that was the, the, the and they were using that interest to um to connect with people to use that not only to connect the scientists with the engagement themselves itself but to, to to allow then that space of hobby and that space of personal interest to be how people were connecting and how the scientist was connecting with people which I thought was interesting because in a sense that was taking them away from the basic research itself, right? That they were, that, that they were, that was part of their daily living. Um, and also um, most of these programs um, were really training the, the, the scientists um, and they were very few of them were actually centering community needs. So, or community interests, um, which I thought was somewhat problematic because of um, it's not really breaking from this intent to really create an equitable partnership, right? It was sort of like, let's, um, it was, there were several projects, there was one program that was specifically trying to call out, call out and deprogram deficit model thinking. So, but in, in, in general, there was this centering of the scientist and the scientist's um, perspective. Um, another interesting result um, is, I think that, it, and this is something that is in a broader context and a lot of us have discussed and, and there's a big field thinking about why do these practitioners engage and communicate this basic science? What motivates them? What drives them? And how motivation and goal 
is often mixed, right? It's not a clear cut, um, not a clear cut um, for this endeavor, if, in, for the scientists themselves so, or the engager that in this, in this case, right? The person that is communicating. So I, I was able to tease out and I intentionally wanted to maintain some of that complexity because I felt it was my perspective that this is how the communicator, this is how the practitioner described it themselves. They didn't necessarily at this point um, describe it as something like, this is my goal and this is my motivation. They were often, uh, it was often a mix, but I was able to see these four themes. The four themes, and this is in particular, these are, uh, to remind you, these are um, scientists that are, or practitioners, excuse me, of science communication that are particularly wanting to engage with basic science. So one of the big thing, themes was, they needed to engage, they, they were wanting to say, okay, I need to have, I need to engage um, people with basic science through connecting them to the application. So I want to tap into my audience's need to understand how important this basic science is going to be to an application later on, that hopefully that, that audience cares for, <laughs> and that, it, you know, that that audience sees as important. And this came up a lot with communicators and, and, and practitioners that were in spaces who, who, or, or jobs that were requiring to, to interface with a lot of stakeholders that were asking them for that engage, for that application, right? So they were in that interesting space where the institution that they were working for was asking them, I need you to connect this to application. But there was also an, a personal in, uh, belief and understanding that this un, for, for for people to understand the application itself was important. The second theme was eliciting awe, which I know we've talked to, and then it's, this is not a common theme in, in science communication. But what I thought was an interesting theme in this space and that way that the, the, the communicators I spoke with, in particular with basic science, they were wanting to talk, tap into awe as a way to access the audience's value system. So they wanted to say, I don't want, this is different as in, in different to application in that they were saying, if I do not want to tap into my own value system, I don't want to tell people why this is important and because I think you should be caring about this application. But if I tap into awe, I can then get people to access their own value system. And that is why I'm doing this. So this is why I want them to appreciate this jellyfish uh, and the way that it works and its beauty and its, its place in the world. So I want to be able to under, I want to tap into that space. And the last one of the two last ones were they, they were really, some of the practitioners really saw communicating and engaging as an act of justice, as something that was essential to the scientist and to the scientist perspective to, in the scientist location as a holder of, of power in, the, in that. And so they really saw the connection between science engaging and communicating in particular basic science um, as an act of justice. In the, and the final was, um, they, I really saw that people, that a lot of the engagers and practitioners in this space were doing it as a source of, 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 of meaning, that this engaging and communicating uh, was in, engendering a source of meaning for the practitioner themselves. Um, but the la one of the last things that I want, I want to getting towards the end is that I did see there was something about basic science itself that was um, unique. It was different in that the... Um, the, the, the culture of basic research is a system that rewards individualism. So if you think of this, you know, the, the, a basic researcher is one that often is selected and, and becomes successful in the basic science space because they are driven to pursue a, a very abstract question themselves. And so they have this joy of self-driven discovery and it's very internally focused. Well, and then engaging and asking them to engage, which is a more collective external work, really often requires them pushing beyond a lot of what they've been trained to do. And so it is a somewhat of a different, a very different mode of, of, of working that, that than many other engages, people that are in the communicating and engagement space. And the last thing is that they really was, um, it, it was very evident through these interviews that institutional support really led to create, to not only um, to people working against a, a culture very, that institutional support was very important in them pushing against what is a very, a culture that does not reward uh, communication and engagement, particularly in the basic science space, 
uh, communication and engagement is seen as very secondary and it's not seen as something that there's there's knowledge hierarchies and that come into play but it was very evident that in, in this space, the institutional support as was not only important for that person thriving in, as, 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 a, as a professional, but also allowing them to push the creative boundaries of what it means to communicate and what it means to engage uh, with basic science. And so I think I'll leave it at that because I want to leave ample space for our, our, our um, and I sort of already mentioned my biggest takeaways, um, but, that 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 is one of the I really um, that are the, the, there are unique aspects to basic science and who are those who are engaging and communicating in this space and oftentimes that exacerbates some of the other problems that um, Katie and 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 um, to some extent Ray um, have already discussed and so that is it <laughs> for me at the moment. Stop sharing. Great, thank you to Ray and Karen um, and to all of you for um, joining today. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'd be happy to discuss.